when I was 28, I, I ticked every box that I had set out to tick. So house, car, girlfriend, business I had dreamed about since I was a kid, TV, radio, a selling book. I had done everything I ever wanted. And I was really struggling with my mental health. And it was the first time in my life that I couldn't point to anything that was wrong. I couldn't say I'm sad because I've got no friends. I couldn't say I'm sad because I'm broke. Everything was right in, in theory. Jiu-jitsu player. <laughs> yes. Shadow shadow worker guru. Storyteller. I thought today we could explore your creative process through the lens of the hero's journey. And I think it really just perfectly mirrors the ups and downs that we can have as writers. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to focus on your most recent book that is coming out in February. Yeah. We're starting in the ordinary world. And I want for you to take yourself back to what life looked like before you began writing. And also give us a sense in that moment when you, you were first sort of tasting, ah, oh, there's another writing project here. Mm. Hmm. Um, each book that I've done sort of feels like uh, the end of a chapter in my life, for lack of a better way of expressing. So like I came from the fitness background. And so when I did a book about fitness, probably 11 years ago, which was a very basic book for people in fitness, that was like, OK, the end of a chapter. And then it was almost like consolidating everything I'd experienced and learned in the previous years. And then a new chapter of life would open up and a new adventure. And so I guess with that in mind, the new book is about shadow. And in some ways, I think it represents the end of the chapter of living in my head. Not that I'm not still in my head somewhat, but a lot of my work after coming out of fitness went then to personal development and very cognitive way of looking at the world and yeah, personal development through the lens of, okay, set goals, write them down, manage your time. It was all very kind of linear. And yeah, as I say, I think this ordinary world prior to this book was linear, conscious, um, uh, taking things very literal, um, being caught up in the moment and the day-to-day. -day. And um, yeah in a bit of a rat race maybe. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And I love the way you describe the books as ending that chapter as well. So we've got you, Pat Davili, about to go on your hero's journey for the fifth time <laughs> in this rat racy, linear, in, in your head place. And yeah. you're starting to get a sense of, hmm, okay, there could be, there could be something coming here. So we've got the call to adventure. So that's like chapter two in the journey. Yeah. So would you say there was a catalyst or a moment that called you to write the book? Um, did that come from something internal, external? What was that call to adventure? It was an internal um laying the stake in the ground kind of thing so um as i mentioned i i came from a fitness background i was lucky enough to do well in that space in ireland and kind of make a name for myself if you will and so i was very insecure when i was younger and i, I lacked a lot of confidence and the idea of becoming successful in the outer world was very important to me in my early 20s and so i worked very hard to build a profile and when my fitness career peaked, I knew it wasn't for me anymore. And so I almost walked away overnight and kind of stepped into the unknown, which was a hero's journey at that time. And I went to personal development and then that felt like, okay, this is new. And it felt authentic until it didn't. And so with this, there was a sense in me that I've been writing books now for a while, so I need to write another book. But there was safer books I could have written, I suppose. There was more I could have looked at 
from a mainstream perspective, what's selling well, and it's probably more personal development stuff. But I want to write a book about shadow because that's what I'm excited about. That's what I'm inspired by. That's what's actually supporting me. So I think the internal call to adventure was you can either keep doing what you're expected to do, whether that's in my head or if that's a reality that, okay, Pat's the personal development guy, so he's supposed to write another kind of straightforward personal development book. Or you can decide internally who you want to be. It's kind of like, you know, the whole premise of shadow for me is that as kids, most of us never got the sense that we were enough as we were maybe. Um, I I was reflecting on that this morning. How often in our childhood was there a felt sense for ourselves? Okay, I'm a good person. I'm good enough as I am. Most of our sense of being a good person or being good enough as we were came from being uh, praised for certain behaviors or for being a certain way. So everything was conditional on doing. And so that means you live your life from an outside in kind of way that I look externally as to how I should live. And um, I think my hero's journey at this point was to recognize what's external, what's internal. So externally, there's an expectation as to what this might look like. Internally, there's something in me that wants to write a book about shadow. And uh, that was the call. You know, can I get a publisher that's going to write a book, wanna, that's going to want to publish a book that's about grief and anger and shame? Um can I put that out there into the world? And and so yeah, that was the call to adventure. Okay, so we've got you in this linear rat racy mind place, suddenly feeling like, okay, I write books, but what if I were to write the book that's really speaking to me? Hmm. So third chapter of the hero's journey is the refusal of that call. Hmm. So talk us through any resistance or fear that brought about some kind of hesitation or doubt in answer to that call. Hmm. Maybe the refusal was not so much the subject of the book, but the content of the book. So you know, I'm going to write a book about shadow and so it's going to look like this and I'm going to break it down into chapters and here's what a shadow book should be and here's what a book should be. So again, it's this kind of should, this like external kind of vision of what it should be. So maybe the refusal was to doing it my way, to actually sharing more of myself. You know, if I'm going to write about grief and shame and fear and anger, I can conceptualize and intellectualize those ideas or I can allow myself to be more of an artist. I think that's probably it. Like this is not a book. Maybe the refusal was to be an artist in this. Maybe I wanted to be a researcher or I wanted to be someone that uh, came across like, wow, he knows what he's doing. And maybe the refusal was to being messy and being transparent and being vulnerable, I guess. I think there was some initial resistance to that. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Interestingly, when you were answering the question, as I was sort of listening and and, try, and waiting for, for me to make sense of what your answer was, I thought you were saying that you refused to do it in any should way. That, and I was like, oh, that's a real... Um, I love the way you've subverted the whole refusal. You're not refusing the call, but you're refusing to do it in the way that people expect. But no, that wasn't what you were talking about. You were actually saying, okay, the refusal was about being artistic and being vulnerable in the way that you handled the material. Yeah, I think maybe unconsciously it was that, you know, like I submitted, say, my first half of the book to the publisher and they said, you know, it's good. There's a lot in this. It's quite heavy. It's quite dense. There's a lot of ideas in this. Uh, maybe some stories would help to ground this a little bit more for the reader. And in that, I recognized I was like, oh, I'm hiding behind the density of this subject. Um, so it was, I think it was an unconscious refusal to actually share uh, where this has come from. I didn't write a book. I'm not writing a book about shadow because I think it's a cute topic that, uh, you know, the mainstream is going to love. I wrote it because it's like, oh, this helps me make sense of the challenges I've had over the last 10 years of my life. 
and uh, that maybe wasn't coming through at first. So that was the refusal. So a little bit of refusal, mm. like let's get bogged down in all this technical stuff and sound like I really know what I'm talking about yeah. and not really share anything about about me and what's what's vulnerable. Yeah. So chapter four, the hero needs to have some sort of mentor experience to help them with what they're refusing. So was there a mentor? Was there a practice, uh, a piece of wisdom that, that you found helped at this stage? So we've, we've actually got to, OK, you've submitted the manuscript and the publisher's like, mm, it's quite dense. So how how did you work through that? What tools did you have? What practices? What mentorship? This is, this is, I like this uh, framework because it's helped me put together things I had not previously put together. So I shared with you when I met you a couple of months ago that I was uh, doing a six month uh, sacred pause. So taking a break from any form of dating for six months and, and just really taking time for myself to look after myself. And in the midst of that, I came across a book called Single on Purpose, which I thought was a clever title. It was like, intentionally choosing to be single for a while to really come to understand yourself and I think this guy goes by the angry therapist is his kind of that was his pseudo name so he went through a divorce and he, he recognized how much of his own needs he had subjugated for, for years and stuff like that and he really took time for himself and he said I'm going to be single on purpose for a given time and I'm really going to make the most of this time so I read this book around the time that I was also writing and it was refreshingly conversational, I would say. He was just having, like he was a therapist, but he was just talking about, then I joined CrossFit and then I did this and I ate donuts on a Wednesday because I wanted to eat donuts and my wife never let me grow my hair. So I grew my hair when we got divorced. And I was just, it was refreshing and there was stuff that I was resonating with. And so I listened to that audio book of him reading it a couple of times. And I think it just started to lay some seeds or plant some seeds for me in terms of, oh, I could, I'd like to bring this kind of style into a more conversational. And that completely shifted how I was writing. So I think he was an informal mentor in a way. And to support that, someone shared the wisdom with me that I think Julia Cameron has spoke about in terms of the artist way, uh, which is a writing program, creative program I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with. I think she talked about you've got a writer and an editor in your own head. And so the writer writes, the editor wants it to make look, wants it to look pretty or whatever. And so again, when I was in that kind of headspace of wanting to write a clever book that would impress therapists or whatever, and was technically sound, I was staring at the screen and I was trying to get every line perfectly. And then between listening to this guy's book, the single on purpose book that was very conversational and getting feedback from my publisher as to, to it needing to be a bit more fluid, I decided, okay, I'm just gonna let the writer write and I'm going to leave the editor in a different room. And so my um, process then became for three hours every morning, I just set a timer and I would just brain dump and I would just write and write and write and write and write and write. And then I would take that piece and that would be the start of a chapter. And then in the evening or the afternoon, I'd do another three hour block on a different chapter. And then the next day I'd come back to the two messy chapters and I'd start to tidy them up a little bit. And then the next day I'd come back and I'd come back and I'd... I think I read that somewhere that like good writing, you write it once and you rewrite it six or seven times. And um, those were the couple of things that shifted things. So um, mm -hmm. listening to someone else's style that appealed to me, getting the feedback in terms of what's actually going to land for a reader and um, allowing the editor to take a break for a while. Mm. It also makes me think about what you shared, Pat, about the enoughness and that experience that we have as children, that sense of, it's almost like this kind of bodily, I need to add something to myself and offer that up to then get the lovely feeling of it being received as a tick or received with pleasure. And I do feel that that, that network that we embed in our system really plays out in the creative process this sort of unconscious i need to add something to what wants to come out yeah and it sounds to me that you hearing that guy's just authentic tell it how it is it resonated because you also had the sense of like oh that's 
that's just what it is to just allow the voice to come out and then you have to put the editor in the next room as well that's really beautifully described there's a mentor john d martini uh, who i quite like i've studied with him years ago and i think john used to say like never waste a perfectly good divorce <laughs> and what he was saying from it was <laughs> His take in it was like, we have painful experiences, but if you can kind of unpack the experience and learn from it, then it's worth the experience. And I guess I kind of took a bit of that mentality into it that like, mm -hmm. same as everyone else, I've had loads of hurt and pain and fear and shame. And I've had all this stuff and I've gone through hell 10 times over in my adult life. And it's kind of like, it doesn't really make sense to just leave all that on the table and not to try and make sense of that for myself or for others. And, um, I don't know if it's Fritz Perl or someone that once said that what's um, what's personal is universal. So what feels the rawest and the most, you know, close to the bone is the stuff that people will resonate with. And, you know, at that time, starting to write some truer stuff about my own grief or my own fear, my own shame, all these different things. And I started getting feedback from friends and they're like, oh, this is the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that validation or, or not a validation, but that kind of. Um, mirroring was useful for me at that time. Mm. And so healing as well, isn't it? When you speak the intricacy of your truth and it's met and mm. understood, oh, it's just like, it's so healing. Yeah. So we are at chapter five. This is crossing the threshold. So you've had a little bit of a refusal like mm, am i gonna am i gonna go the should path or am i gonna go the vulnerable path the mentors turned up at the right time listening to the audible finding the voice putting the editor in mm. the in the next room so when did you fully commit to the writing process if we were to describe it as the the more vulnerable the more detailed truthful aspects um you know was there was there like a defining moment when you knew there was no turning back because that's really what defines the crossing the threshold it's like you've gone over and there is almost a sense of like oh actually i i couldn't turn back even if i wanted to because something's something's shifted here mm. yeah i think it was the book's got a chapter on anger and uh, the importance of anger and the, the kind of the power of anger and the, the shadow of not expressing or allowing anger and how that comes out and kind of people pleasing tendencies and resentment and all, you know, all these. And so I told this story about a time where I just overlooked my needs time and time and time again and just like really um, felt I had abandoned myself and I just felt so weak and collapsed and, you know, it just really broke me and it was in relation to someone else. And so I, I wrote this story and a part of me felt self-pitying and I felt weak sharing the story and I had all these kind of st things coming up and I probably doubted myself as I was about to send that to my publisher so they gave me this feedback that they wanted more personal story and I was thinking oh is this too much or but at that point I think that was crossing the threshold because irrespective of what they came back with I think they I'd started to find my flow. I'd, I'd share that with a couple of people that had resonated and I felt if they don't vibe with this and they're not into this, I'm probably going to have to go a different route and figure out a different way because this is the style I'm going with now. Um, that was the, the crossing of the threshold, was telling the story, sharing it with someone or a couple of people and having them say to me, oh, I was there with you in that moment and I've been in that moment and I wanted to be with you to support you in that. Um, mm -hmm. That was it, I think that mm. sharing of vulnerability and being met with, oh, I know that one, as opposed to yeah. anyone trying to fix or change it, you know? And it's interesting because as you were describing the writing and then that, that sort of judgment or like, you know, God, am I really writing this? There's the sense I get is like almost this sort of, recalibration because if you choose to put yourself behind this new story that you want to tell on the page versus acting as if it's if it's unshareable you're you're totally recalibrating mm. do, do you know what i mean yeah yeah can you tell us a little bit more like give us 
give us a bit more insight because I know there will be so many writers who have this experience of putting the words down and a part of them is like, this is my truth and I have an experience of sharing this truth with someone and it was met and they related to it and yet here's this voice being like, no, no chance, isn't going to happen, no one's going to want this, this is going to ruin your career or whatever it is. So how do you how do you get through that moment, keep the words coming on the page and then allow that recalibration to take place? Well, I mean, a lot of my work is around uh, shadow, of course, as I talk about. So I need to practice what I preach with that. But, but something I often share with people is the most important work you'll ever do with your shadow. So the disowned parts of yourself or the kind of difficult parts of yourself is to tame or tend to your inner critic. And I think it's important that people recognize that your inner critic's job is to keep you safe and to do something you haven't done before feels unsafe. And so when you're at the threshold, whatever the threshold might be, and it could be the threshold of vulnerability that I'm going to share this thing I've never shared before, don't be surprised when your inner critic comes in and it's almost a, a sign. It's like, oh, cool, I'm pushing into something new here. That's why my critic is telling me that my story is pitiful or that no one's going to relate or whatever it might be. So I think it's partially that. It's like, don't expect to move into something new. Don't expect to create something that's never been created before without that critic coming in and saying, who do you think you are? Um, that would be the main piece I would say that comes up for me. And then the other pieces that I would find useful sometimes will be to look to the people that you admire the most. So look to the creatives, the artists, the musicians, the the stories that you love the most and look at the vulnerability that probably came from them. You probably not relating to the person who's, I mean, we talk about the hero's journey. Uh, you, we don't read stories about a hero that goes from A to B in a straight line and just has an easy day at the office. We read stories about people that go to hell and back because we see ourselves in the story. So you gotta be willing to be in the fire and I guess alchemize, you know, and, and, and um, yeah, allow yourself to be cooked. So you've managed to cross the threshold. You got past the threshold guardian of the inner critic. So once you cross the threshold, you send the chapter on anger to your publisher. Chapter six, tests, allies and enemies. So here's the part in your journey where you um, face a test or, or plural, and those can be external or internal. But then you also discover some allies. Those, those could be people, those could be practices, and they support you along the way as you're getting tested. And then you also encounter enemies. So that can be, again, it can be internal, it can be self-doubt, it can be an external challenge as well. Mm. So how could you summarize at this point a test, an ally, and an enemy? I think a test is, I think this is true of anything uh, that you create. Uh, I see it in social media in, in a big way that when someone puts something out there on social media and it gets some attention or validation, there's a part of that person that recognizes, oh, that's popular. Maybe I should do more of that. And I think for me in a similar way, I was like, oh, this story worked really well. I like this story. I need to look for more stories like that. And so the creativity gets a little bit shut down potentially because you're looking for more of the same. That was, or I was looking for more of the same. So you get one or two great stories. I'm like, oh, these are great. And I'm almost rooting for stories and trying to make a round hole fit into a square peg. So I think that's a test. My allies were people that I could just send voice notes to and say, hey, Gabriella, I'm going to read you five minutes of an intro to a chapter if you get some space in the next couple of days and you could just give me your initial feedback I'd really appreciate it those were my allies just um, mm. certain people that would give a genuine response and um, they were my allies for sure just to I found the nature of writing is you're looking at the same page you know even if I'm doing my my weird process of doing a couple of hours and leaving it and come back tomorrow when you're looking at the same story again and again and again and again, you go through phases where you're like, wow, this is genius. And then you think, oh, this is awful. And it's good to have those people that you can lean on just to get a, a fresh set of eyes on it. So they were the allies. The enemies, is that what we said? Enemies was the word? Mm -hmm. um, 
I would say the enemy was like a certain texture of inner critic that wants to be impressive to my peers. It was probably that. It was kind of like, okay, I'm sharing this vulnerable story that the lay person will relate to. But when a psychologist picks up that book, are they going to say, oh, he's weak? Mm. <laughs> that was probably mm. the... So, he's weak, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, um, in the psychotherapeutic space, like the, I guess traditionally, like psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, sometimes there would be a lot of, like, don't disclose your own personal process in this because that's not your job. Whereas coaching and, and other modalities maybe there's more of a tendency to share more of yourself so sometimes i can find i'm playing up to wanting to i want to be approachable but i also want to be respected and there's a part of me that wants to be respected within the industry and the enemy again was probably a sense of oh i can share this and the person who's going through that's going to understand it but someone else is going to criticize it maybe that was the critic or the enemy I mean, we've got this truth that is coming out in the form of creative expression. And it's like listening to you, I'm just reminded of how tender it is. Like I always make the analogy of it is just the shoot coming out of that seed. So we've got the kind of gusting winds of saying, I want I want to really know what this shoot is. Like this shoot has to be the same as the story I told yesterday because that was a great story. So only shoots that look like this story are allowed to come out of the mm, seed. Mm, mm. Or hang on, wait, this shoot isn't going to get me credibility in the in the psychotherapy world. Like no, bad shoot. Go go back inside the seed and, and come out a little bit more dignified. Like it's it's so it's such an important job to let that tiny little fragile green stalk just to come out and sort of protect it from everything that wants to get at it and just let it come out as it wants to. Hmm. I, I guess I'm having uh, memories of, uh, I've had both sides of the coin. The greatest compliment I'll get is, uh, or one of the greatest compliments I get is Pat can make complex and sometimes unaccessible ideas very accessible and very um grounded in reality and then the opposite i will sometimes hear from academics or psychologists is that i dumb things down to an embarrassing level mm. so maybe mm. maybe the enemy was oh am i dumbing this down am i am i doing a disservice to to this work um yeah that's yeah those two those two mm. thank you pat <laughs> So you made it, the tests, the allies and the enemies. Thank goodness for your gorgeous allies who were mm. responding to those voice notes. Mm. So at this point in your journey, this is chapter seven. So here's where the hero approaches the inmost cave. And it's the moment in writing the book where you approach so we're not yet in the cave but you're approaching the deepest most vulnerable part of yourself and at some point there's going to be a confrontation but here you're just approaching so maybe there's some denial in that approach maybe you really start to slow down mm. so what what part of the journey do you feel could speak to this moment the approach of the inmost cave uh, I'm going into specifics here, but I would say I wrote about grief in the, I have a chapter on grief in, in the book and uh, the the premise or some of the premise at least is that sometimes grief is thought of as the loss of someone we love. Uh, when the bigger context, grief can be the loss of old identities, grief can be the loss of um, friendships, relationships, grief can be the loss of the life that we hoped for that we didn't receive. And I think that chapter felt kind of edgy for me to write as well. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, there was kind of fear around how it would be perceived. Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an Irish man that grew up in a culture where sensitivity was shunned and uh you know we drank like fish in our teens and 20s to avoid feeling anything and so there's probably remnants of my youth a fear of being judged or shamed or 
ridiculed for talking about feelings and talking about grief in that way and hearing voices in my head of get over yourself and get on with it and man up and all that kind of stuff. I would say that was probably, you know, I often share with people that, you know, as a man growing up, anger was really the only emotion that was safe to show because if you showed grief, you were weak. If you showed too much joy, you were a pansy and you were weak. If you showed too much of anything, expression, too much, but anger kept you safe because you could push people away. And so, yeah, I think writing the chapter about grief was a little bit of, yeah, a bit of fear there. It's like, how's this going to be received? Am I going to be seen as weak? Am I going to be judged? Am I going to be shamed? Or am I going to go for this? Mm. Yeah, I'm with you in this moment. You're approaching and it's bringing up all of that conditioning and it's it's this strange combination of it's all been internalized so you're almost turning against yourself you have to almost just keep the, the enough contact with that truth to guide you mm. and then you've got the imagined external so the the subsequent chapter is ordeal so this is the moment that we meet that challenge. We go into that cave. So you go like fully into the grief cave, fully into like, I'm going to be sensitive. I'm going to be soft. I'm going to be gushy. Like what, what happened in that moment when you went in the cave and how did you meet the challenge of like, what are people going to think? I think, um, it's 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 really interesting for me to to explore this through the lens of the hero's journey because so much of shadow work is about the hero's journey and um my you know I, I talk about it actually in the book that the you know metaphorically the hero tackles the dragons but really what we're tackling in our own story is the shadow and the parts of ourselves that have been pushed away so that was me uh, I think, I think for me that was um, there's an archetype called the ordinary guy or the ordinary man or the uh, everything I've done over the last ten years, leaning into personal development, leaning into emotional wellness, leaning into meditation, all these different things. They're a bit of a stretch for where I came from. There's always been a fear of going too far, and so the ordinary man archetype has been a part of me that has kept me grounded in my community and my culture so if i ever feel i'm getting too far removed from what the mainstream wants the ordinary man part of me pulls me back in and says no wait don't go too far you want to maintain kind of people people like you sharing a little bit of this but don't be too much and so i think that cave was really just saying no i i'm not going to because change is not going to happen in culture if people always fear going too far you got to be willing to go too far to change culture um, and so I think that was it I think I was able to hold that I was able to recognize this is scary but this is a threshold another threshold and this is me confronting my shadow this is me confronting the fear of being too sensitive the fear of being too vulnerable the fear of showing myself the fear of being abandoned all that kind of stuff and um, that was what I was dealing with in the cave mm. And also what comes to me, Pat, is, and this is, I suppose, also tied up in shadow work, it's approaching it consciously because there's almost like the shadow side of going too far and then the self-aware side of going too far. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Only you can know your own edge and... Um, people try to blow themselves over the edge or but you got to walk over the edge I think consciously yeah and I I see that I see that wound show up a lot in in the writers in my community where they're they're going too far but without that awareness and of course the pattern of that is inviting rejection or it's inviting people to say tone it down because you're just going to replay so it, it's beautiful to have this example of someone going into the cave, knowing what, knowing what's in there waiting for them and being able to, to, take, that, to take that ordeal from a self-aware place. 
it's just so, some, something I share in, in the book and I know we're not talking specifically of the content of the book but I feel some of it comes across or, or applies I talk about oppositional identity and oppositional identity is when we have something in us that you know the hero's journey for me is about individuation so becoming your authentic self and becoming your true expression and allowing that to unfold and a lot of people will create these oppositional identities where they say things like I'll never be like my father or I'll never be like her. And so we're not choosing who we want to be. We're choosing what we're not going to be. So it's a reaction. It's, it's, it's a reaction. It's not a choice. And so that idea of unconsciously trying to be too much, uh, I think is also a reaction. It's kind of like, I'll show them rather than I'll show them who I am. It's I'll show them. It's a different energy. I love that distinction. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? How it's the same, the, the, the intention is, is the same. It's a wanting to reveal, but the difference between wanting to reveal in opposition to what I perceive is going on versus wanting to reveal because I just want to open up and reveal the softness that's inside me. Mm. So the ordeal when met in a conscious way as part of the hero's journey leads to the reward or in many cases this is referred to as the seizing of the sword <laughs> so after facing this challenge what inner or outer rewards did you receive for me it's been a uh an appreciation for writing and the healing power of writing that's been the reward because as you said I've done five books now or this is my fifth and it's the one that has been the most enjoyable and there's been actually the least resistance because it's felt more like uh, expressive writing than it has researched or or trying to I don't know as it going from impressive writing to expressive writing or trying to be impressive writing um so the gift has been, you know, it's brought me back to doing morning pages every day. It's brought me back to um, just appreciating how much value there is in working with our own stories, whether no one ever reads them. Um, you know, in, in recovery groups, like 12-step recovery groups and AA and these different uh, therapy groups, they talk about um, shame. They say shame dies in when secrets are told in safe spaces or something like that. Um, so shame goes to die when secrets are told in safe spaces. And so our lies uh, keep us sick and our secrets keep us sick. And so if you can start by telling your secrets to yourself or your lies to yourself, if you can start telling the truth with yourself, even if no one ever reads it, it starts to help you heal. Um, so I think that's been the gift for me has been the healing power of writing. Uh, a certain amount has gone in the book, but a lot has gone into my journal that's like, okay, this is the truth. Like, can I be honest with myself? Because if I can't be honest with myself, then what am I doing? Um, that's been the gift. Seizing the sword. What was, how did you express it? It's writing to express yourself versus to impress. I think so. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I love that. So you seize the sword of writing to express yourself, telling your truth either to yourself or to your potential readers. So here at chapter 10, we, as the hero, we start to take the road back. Mm. So we've had all of this incredible battle and confrontation and opportunity to gain insight. So once the manuscript was nearing completion, how did you navigate the idea of returning? So it might be that you're returning from the focus of writing to to beginning to think, right, I've had, you know, this is going to be a book one day and I'm going to have to share it. Mm -hmm. Or just from being, you know, deep in your own shadow work as you wrote the book. What was what was the journey back or the road back for you like? I'm probably s semi still in it in the sense of like handing in the manuscript and then is really nice to get two months of space from it where it goes to the team and they read and they give their feedback and stuff like that. So it was really good to, as I say, when you're in it and you're writing the book, you start to question yourself, you know, is this, is this, this makes sense? It goes from making perfect sense to not making any sense to being brilliant, to being awful, all that kind of stuff. And so I've always found it, generally I've found it 
really nice to get that space and then just come back and read it. And the nature of how I live is that I, I tend to uh, reflect quite a bit just in general, you know, what's going on in my life, what's th what's happening here. So there's always threads happening for me in my life, understanding. So in the two months since the book was handed in, there's been things that have happened in my life that I'm like, okay, this can slot in here or here or here. Um, so I'm not fully there, but it, it's... Um, it's the re it's a relaxed kind of icing on the cake. That's what it feels like now. It's like there's no force, there's no tension, there's no there's no stress. It's just like there's little bits here that I can add, there's little tweaks that I can make, and um, there's a relaxation around it. And you're kind of ready to I've, I've dressed the kid up. It's ready to go to school, kind of thing. I don't know. <laughs> it does sound like I mean these weren't the words that you use but I just got the sense of that weight lifting you're out of that place of like I'm a genius no I'm a I'm a failure like this is great this is awful and you can you can hand it over put some attention on other areas of your life and we have this kind of road back and as you said you like to reflect and a lot of reflection does happen at this point and then we come into what's called a resurrection so we've had all of the fighting and the dragons and the slaying and then we're coming home and we're reflecting, but actually there is this final moment of resurrection where we might consider how the completion of the book has changed us in some way, um, some kind of rebirth, either as, as a writer in your personal life. So where, where reveals itself to you when you think about a resurrection or a rebirth? I think... Um particularly the last two months before the deadline and become very aware of what's got to be done here. And so I cleared my calendar very, like really got rid of most of what was in my calendar. And so my life became very simple. It was get up and it was write for three hours, take a break, go for a walk and write for three more hours. And that was my day every day. And turn off the phone, turn off the laptop. And there was this sense of, okay, I'm I'm creating something here. And then as soon as the book was handed in, the calendar started getting busy again and it then and there's like does all these different things. So I think the resurrection is the understanding. I mean, Cal Newport wrote that book a couple of years ago called Deep Work and he talked about how, you know, in in what's in low supply is in high demand and the thing that's in lowest supply now is focus. So so few people have genuine focus and Having a, a having clarity, having a focus, having an expressive outlet, uh, having a simple life, I really valued all of those things, and I had those things, and so I want to do that again. And um, when you've got a deadline, sometimes that just happens. So I think the resurrection is just consciously bringing more of that into my life, simplifying my calendar, simplifying my life, simplifying my projects. Um, it was easy to say no to people and to create boundaries because there was a, a project and then it's easy for those boundaries to disappear for me when, when, when I don't have a project. So the resurrection is the recognition that if you want to do meaningful things in the world, you've got to prioritize them and you've got to focus and you've got to go deep on them. You can't, you can't do a hundred meaningful things at the same time. They're not meaningful anymore. So... For me, it's trying to minimalize in my life and focus. That's interesting because it makes me reflect on how the idea of sacrifices we make when we're immersed in a creative project aren't actually sacrifices, but they could teach us a new way of being in our lives that we actually prefer. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, for me personally, at least, there's been gifts and you know, something I, I try to come back to frequently that I think serves me well in life is as humans, we all have needs. So we've, we've all got different needs. Some people need a lot of creativity. Other people need a lot of social connection. Other people need a combination of both. Other people need a lot of physical touch. There's the abundance of needs. And I think if you want to live a happy and fulfilled life, it's important to know your needs and to prioritize those needs. And uh, when I think about writing, that definitely supports me from a creative outlet. And then sometimes when I'm not working on a book or something, the writing disappears and suddenly I feel a bit more anxious and I feel a bit more stressed. And it's like, ah, I'm not meeting my need for creativity. So my mind is creating problems because it doesn't have anything else to focus on. So, um, yeah, it's it's it was a gift. It is a gift. Mm. Mm, it sounds like it. So we're at the final chapter 
here's where we return with the elixir so the book is written what elixir or you know this could be wisdom that you are bringing back to your readers so here is your opportunity to reflect on what you hope others will gain from the material um and what you're what you'll bring you know what you're bringing to the village essentially mm. Mm. um when i go into a bookshop it makes me aware of it's interesting to write a book and, and then to go into a bookshop because when you write a book you put a year of your life or whatever you put into it and it's like a lot of time a lot of energy a lot of and then you go into a bookshop and there's tens of thousands of books and you don't look at most of them because it's just not you know you, there's just too many books so you go to what is matter and that helps me take my my ego and my ambition out of it I, I don't expect everyone to love my book or everyone to want my book or everyone i don't expect any of that so my hope is just that the people who I hope that people can learn from, I believe like if we pick up this type of book, non-fiction books, it's like, okay, well you pick up a book and you're picking up on someone's life experience. They've put 20 or 30 or 40 years of their lived experience into a book. And if you can take two or three insights, it might help you. So the elixir I hope is what I shared earlier, just being a man who had a lot of insecurity, a lot of self-doubt, was sensitive emotionally, but couldn't express it drank too much in his 20s to try and numb himself to what he was feeling overworked like did all this stuff and i think i'd like to see younger guys 10 years younger than me pick up the book and pick up a few things that helped them to accept themselves a little bit earlier than i did and um yeah it's that and i mean shadow i'm almost pushing back on the personal development industry that's very happy clappy and telling you you're supposed to be happy all the time and i'm giving people permission to feel all their feelings i hope so that's what I'm trying to do, I think. Yeah. Mm. As you were talking about the the ten year younger version reading the book, it did make me curious about what Pat in his twenties what difference this book would have made, or perhaps I need to find you even younger because in your twenties you were already making changes. So. Can you can you almost be like a give us a fly in the wall of a version of you? I suppose you need to be ready because there might have been a version of you who looked at this book and thought, "What the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not yeah. reading this." Yeah, so yeah. where where would we need to find you, and what difference do you think it would have made if it had caught you earlier? Um, when I was 28, I I ticked every box that I had set out to tick: so house, car, girlfriend business I had dreamed about since I was a kid TV, radio, best-selling book I had done everything I ever wanted and I was really struggling with my mental health and it was the first time in my life that I couldn't point to anything that was wrong, I couldn't say I'm sad because I've got no friends, I couldn't say I'm sad because I'm broke, everything was right in, in theory, so mentally I ran out of road, so it was kind of like, for a certain period of my life, the personal development stuff and the very cognitive way of living supported me because I could write things down and go make them happen and I felt like I'm the master of my faith. But when you reach a point or when I reached a point of having things on paper that were working but not feeling good within myself, that's when I came to realize, okay, there's a split happening here. There's my head and there's my body and they're telling two different stories. And um, I went to the doctor, I got my bloods taken, I was trying to get like figure out what's going on. There must be a hormonal imbalance. There must be something going on here because this doesn't make sense to me. So logically, nothing made sense anymore. And then I went to a psychiatrist, psychologist, shamans, energy healers. I went to every type of person. And um, and that's when I realized I wasn't listening to my emotions. I was just listening to the expectations of the outside world. And it's kind of cliche, but I ran out of places to look. I'd look to success. I'd look to women. I'd look to money. I'd look to... <clears throat> everywhere else except for to my feelings um so i think if that 28 year old version of me which is eight years ago had picked up the book it would have sped up things a little bit for him hmm. i'm so curious about this idea of speeding things up pat <laughs> <laughs> uh 
And let's let's sort of end with this one, I suppose, because while, when I asked you the question, there was a curiosity around it, but I, I felt some resistance to asking it because I suppose I'm in a place where I, re where I really understand the order of everything had to happen. Mm. And I sort of wonder if, if I could put everything I know now in an essay and post it back in time, could I, could I speed it up? So I'm, I'm curious around how you think about that. Like, is it, is it just a way of seeing things that if we can implant that way of seeing things in our younger selves, we can make that shift faster? I mean, I thought I was, you know, when I was the personal development guy in my twenties, I definitely had that belief. Okay, if you want to be like Elon Musk, you read the book and you pick up his tools and you just do them, and it was very again that kind of. You know. Now, <clears throat> I mean, my ultimate belief is that you know, if you want to, if you if, if you want to support people in changing, you've got to love them. So you got to love them as they are. So, mm -hmm. Anthony de Mello, famous Jesuit priest, he once had a quote, something to the effect of. Um, I was neurotic for years that, and I was anxious and I was lonely and I was depressed and everything in me wanted to change and everyone around me kept telling me to change and I was desperate to change and everyone kept telling me to change and no matter what I did I couldn't change and then he said one day I met someone and they told me don't change I love you exactly as you are mm -hmm. and he said in that moment I softened and I came alive and suddenly everything in my life changed and I hope the book or any work that I do gives people permission to not feel the need to change. So I say in the book, it's, this is not a book about personal development, it's a book about self-understanding. And so I think the 28-year-old 28 28 -year version of me, it could have been faster, not for the sake of faster, but it could have been, it would have removed the resistance of trying to be different. It would have allowed myself to be myself and then I could have gone from that place. Because it was all the battling with myself that was slowing me down in terms of my own happiness and, and, and uh, fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice, that idea of someone just holding the book and in their reading experience, just like, I can yeah. just be me. Well, as we said earlier, what if your inner critic is your friend trying to support you? What if your perfectionist is just trying to stop you from putting yourself out there before you're ready what if you're you know yeah pat thank you so much for going on the hero's journey with me. <laughs> thank you i enjoyed it it was great thank you what what reflection do you do you have now just having gone on this journey and being able to look at the writing process through this um yeah through this framework which can be helpful i find and my mind is putting together a formula of a, a, of, of a supportive system, which is to have time to write every day and have somewhere to bring that writing to get reflections. You know, that's what I took was I had my allies and I had my container to write in. And so it's uh, continuing to bring that into my life on a consistent basis. And uh, yeah, yeah. And to write because I want to write, reminding myself of write because I want to write. Don't write because there's an offer of a book deal, write because there's something to be written um, and let it come through as opposed to looking for something. Thank you so much, Pat. And let's do let's do the business bit. If people have listened to this and thought, oh, this guy sounds like just the kind of thing I need in my life right now. I really want to tell him that or where can I reach him what's he doing what would you say thank you I'm not doing very much because I'm trying to refine as I say so I do a weekly donation based breathwork class on a Thursday night which is a really good opportunity just to slow down and make some space for yourself it's an hour long session every Thursday and I've got a facilitator training for breathwork that happens in February and uh, applications for that are open soon but that's all I'm doing really and then the book will come out in February Beautiful. Thanks, Pat. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>